front of us. But it's 635. I don't know if anybody saw any of this on the news today, but it was pretty amazing. We were stuck right in the middle of it. Um, unfortunately, they got off and headed back to Kansas City, and we were heading somewhere else, so we didn't get to follow the whole thing. Uh, besides that, we also got to visit Gates Barbecue today, one of my favorite places. Um, again, my name is Justin Whitehead. I'm a security and forensic analyst at One World Labs in Denver, Colorado. Um, I really dig my job. I get to spend a lot of time. Uh, one of my specialties is actually social engineering and physical break-ins. Um, God bless the Army for teaching me how to do such things. Yes, thank you Army people back there. Um, Hi, my name is Antonio. I work with uh, Justin back in Denver as a security consultant. My background is in writing and building applications, and I spent six years doing that. It took me that much, that long, six years to realize that the joy is not in building and writing applications, but in breaking them. So um, that's what I'm doing now. Um. So when we actually sat down to write this talk, uh, we get a lot of flack from people that are like, oh, I'm the super pen tester. Um, we wrote this more with junior pen testers in mind. Um, a lot of the guys who are stuck at what I refer to as the pen test puppy mills, where all they're allowed to do is run a Nessus script and then make reports off of that. Um, some of the older pen testers out there, some of you gray haired guys who may have lost your way along the way. Um, started relying solely on the tools. And then mainly because we wanted to break the tools. Um, a lot of this came from, we went to DerbyCon last year and a bunch of other conferences, DEF CON, B-Sides. Here's my shameless plug for B-Sides Las Vegas. If you can't afford to get out there or you don't think you can, sign up to be a volunteer. That's all I ever do and it's pretty <coughs> rad. You don't have to worry about a single cost while you're out there. Um, but what we found was, um, we went to a talk given by John Strand, if any of you know who he is. Hell yeah. Amazing speaker, like so much fun to see him speak. One of the things he said, if you can be replaced by a tool, you will be. Everybody's looking to cut costs, um, especially in the world of security, oddly enough. Um, So this is a stock photo from our company. Um, that's actually me in the front, our C CTO in the back. There's Antonio right there, and our other senior pen tester. Um, we kind of sat there dumbfounded, like we kept hearing everybody talking about it. Everybody's using the tools, everybody's using the tools, everybody's using the tools, but nobody really was showing any way how not to use the tools. And then we kind of had like the little light bulb moment of, holy shit, that's a great talk. So we actually started coming up with our talk based off of that. Uh, Why we're here, um, we understand a lot of us, how many pen testers do I actually have out here? All right, we all know that lovely, or that lovely engagement where we have a class B in three days. No, you can't do that manually. Um, we're also going to go over why some of the reasons to test manually. Uh, a lot of the things that we did, like I said, we went in and broke the tools to see why they didn't work. Um, we're going to focus on web application testing. Um, it's a lot of what any pen tester gets stuck doing. It's pretty much the eighth data hell to me. Um, but it is something that we have to do. Why you are here, we think. Uh, we're hoping you, we can teach you to be uh, some of the ways to be a little bit more stealthy attacker. Uh, to mystify the idea that the scanners are the, the, the only way to go. And make you as a pen tester a valuable asset that won't be replaced by a tool. And also to make you a rich monkey. Uh, the problem, tools are constrained by a set of rules. Any of the pen testers out here will tell you, rules are meant to be broken. And that's the first thing I try to do when I go on site. Tools are in addition to testing. They shouldn't be your be all, end all to testing. We don't want you to turn out to be a scanner monkey junkie. Again, I kind of make the joke of pen test puppy mills. Um, I feel bad for the guys who get stuck there. We're also hiring for a senior level pen tester. You really have to know your shit, but we're hiring. We 
want you to end up like this poor little fella, stealing hubcaps. Um, solution, uh, we're gonna manually test some of these. Uh, we, we created a website and intentionally added vulnerabilities to it that should totally be picked up by most, most of the scanners. Uh, we're gonna go over XSS, SQL injection, and command injection. Everybody's like, oh, well that's easy shit. Well, why, why, why do you miss it on a pen test? The last pen test Antonio and I just did, we were able to get SQL injection and actually upload a script to it and then turn around to get command injection and kept moving from there and their poor site is being taken down right now. I'm gonna to refer to the OWASP top 10. I keep getting older, but they say the same age. All right, all right. <laughs> Cross-site scripting, you can read the review for yourself. What I always what, try to get people to take away from it, it's always in the OAuth top 10. It has been for 15 years now. Uh, the key component of testing against cross-site scripting is the context. SQL injection, again, if you don't know what it is, take a look at the review. Um, always in the OAuth top 10 again. And the key for finding is SQL injection is testing input that is not correctly sanitized. Command injection. Uh, you can read the top. I'm just going to go to my favorite slide here. And thank you, Metasploit, and especially Egypt. I love Shell. I love going through your stuff. Originally, I started in forensics uh, here in Overland Park for a small law firm. There's things that I've seen that I can't unsee now. Uh, I don't know what it is with rich white guys, but the richer and whiter and smaller you are, the fatter your mistress. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we did, uh, we took Nessus straight out of the box, uh, didn't change anything, and I want to make this really clear, we are not bashing on a single one of these tools because we use all of them, that's why we were able to do this. Uh, but we took Nessus straight out of the box, Went to, did all the updates and went to the web application tests now that they have. We built all of our own plugin setups for these. Um, we don't mess with what they have. It, they're good if you don't know what you're doing, but they always need to be altered. So we ran it, ran 11,000 requests. Our page, we know had command injection, SQL injection, and cross-site scripting. It didn't find shit, except for information. Next, we turn to SQL Map. We do love the open source software as much as anybody else out here, because it's awesome and it's free, and those guys, in my opinion, are pretty much the rock stars of our community. I don't have that much time to spend. I actually spent way too much time making my Roomba chase the cat. Uh, we did actually do a little bit of setup on it. We changed the level to five, risk to three, as high as humanly possible. Went through it, didn't find a single thing, but it took it 20,000 requests. What IDS is not going to see this? Burp, I, I, I've become the biggest fan of Burp and I will plug them shamelessly. Uh, we went ahead and ran Burp. Got it to go ahead and index the page for us. 1,100 requests again, and first time it actually found something. Burp actually found one of our exploits, um, which was pretty awesome. Um, we had messed and messed with this thing, but it did miss two very, very basic, uh, very basic things: the cross-site scripting and the SQL injection. And anybody that knows or has ever used Burp knows that it will find those things in a heartbeat. Tools. This is kind of our, my little conclusion part here. Settings are always important. You can't just pull these things out of the box. It's also like anything else. I'm getting really tired of sea level people saying we need the newest blinky thing and not wasting or not spending the money on buying the, hiring the person that can actually read the blinky thing. Uh, tweaking is important. We change our scripts every time we go on site. Uh, we have an awesome OSINT analyst team that basically rocks and will tell us pretty much everything we need to know. 
tools. You saw between those requests how many, or how many requests it actually took to find anything. Again, any IDS is going to find that. Uh, we're going to reference BERT kind of for the rest of our demonstration to kind of as our baseline, uh, mainly because it was the only thing that found something. All right, so from here on, I'll be taking over and doing a bit of uh, demo. Let's hope the demo gods are with us today. Um, we were practicing on our demo gods dance, but I don't think it's ready yet, is it? No, it's not. Okay. So we're going to focus on reflected cross-site scripting uh, for this demo. Uh, usually when we uh, are looking for um, cross-site scripting using a probe like the one on the second line is usually enough. And the reason is because with the single quote, the double quote, and the closing, uh, the closing tag and the whole tag, it should be usually generally enough to get out of any context where cross-site scripting can land, can land. But the thing is that we as humans do not need to just guess what context we are at. We can look at the source HTML of the site and figure out where we have landed and therefore um, guess the context or just discover the context. So let's go with the demo for cross-site scripting. This is our fabulous fabulous site, HTML5, CSS3 or 4, I don't know, I hope there are not any front developers in the room to criticize the design. Um, it has a home page with an interesting link here, it has a members section where you can see who's um, on the site with profiles, and it has a login form. So if we're going to find cross scripting, we want to find the sites, the, the, the places on the site that take some input and give us something back based on that input. Hopefully reflect that, use that input as part of the output. So you take the input and the, the resulting page will have that input. So we're going to go and um, look at this. Um, we see a file name in the URL. Uh, it doesn't quite yell XSS, so um, because the name of the file is not present on the output at all, rather it's contents, so I'm going to skip that. The members section, um, uh, it might be uh, an interesting place. I see an input here, 42, and an output here, 42, so maybe there's a relationship there, so, I can, so I'm going to add something to that value submit it and see if it affected the output. It uh, doesn't look like, but I'm just going to verify by looking at the HTML and I don't see nothing actually um, affected the output. So I'm going to move on. I have a login form. Login forms are widely known for, their, uh, for being vulnerable to cross-site scripting and SQL injection, so let's try our luck and see what happens. First of all, I'm just going to submit it with nothing. And I get an error message that reads, nobody here with the username. Something. It's kind of it's suggesting that there's something else that is missing after the username. So I'm going to go back, put some input, and see what happens. It's a few letters, a completely denying input that is not going to harm, it's going to be, it's not going to be detected. And now I get something back. So I can see that my input directly influenced the result, the body of, the pa of this page. So now it's time that I, uh, to look where this 1337 landed in the HTML code. And I can see that the 1337 is between two div tags. So that tells me that right now I am in a HTML context. If I was to inject anything in here, it would have to start with a new HTML tag. That is something that I can do as a, as a human, but it's not so trivial for a tool. So the next thing I'm going to try is to actually inject something. So I'm going to inject a new HTML tag, some payload, send it, and it worked. That, that on its own is enough proof that cross-site scripting is present on the page. I was able to inject an HTML tag for bold 
and some content that was affected by it. And I can see it present here on the HTML, the B tag, within the div tags that we looked at previously. Obviously, this is not very useful. What we want, what we want is to run some client-side JavaScript, so let's inject the uh, script HTML tag and go with the classic uh, alert box to see what happens. And it works! Woo! Yay! <laughs> so we found cross-site scripting on this side, and we can understand to some extent why Nessus or SQL map didn't find it. After, after all, those tools are not specialized on this type of web application testing. That's okay. The good question is, why didn't Burp catch it? Burp is really good at finding reflected XSS, especially reflected. So, the reason why Burp didn't catch it is because tools use markers. They place these markers around the payload, on the request, and then they look at the response, find those markers, find what's in between the markers, and judge whether there was cross scripting or not. This is an example payload of what Burp does. The arrows point to the markers at either side of the payload, and after Burp sends the request, sends this request, it will look at the response, find the same markers, look at what's in the middle, and decide whether there was cross scripting or not. So the reason why Burp didn't find it is because we tricked Burp. We did some, something on the back end of the application on purpose in order to trick Burp and just delete anything that was a marker. We did that with this just couple of lines that will find the uh, less than sign on the input and replace it 1337. That's why we're getting 1337 on the body of the page. So this is only to prove the point that a couple of lines can confuse a tool and that um, sometimes that's why human manual testing may be required. So that's it for process scripting, SQL injection, we're going to find it and exploit it. Um, in the previous screen that uh, Justin showed, uh, SQL Mat used this payload up there as its basic heuristics and uh, but we're going to use, we're going to use something similar but smaller. The reason is, is because we can now judge the context a little better. We know it's a PHP application. If we were looking at the web request, we knew, we would know it's a Apache server. So we can assume there's a MySQL behind it. That's just an assumption, a good guess. So that's what we're going to use. So where could there be SQL injection on this site? Well, this looks like a file name, but what if it's a file name in a table? It could be. So let's use a payload, send it, and see what happens. I get a blank page. That could be an indication of blind SQL injection. But you know what? We're going to move on. Leave that aside as a potential, but move on. We have a login form. Of course, we have to try the same thing on the login form. Does it look like I am not seeing any evidence of SQL injection yet? So let's move on to the member section. It looks like an, the obvious place was database interaction. I see repeated records displayed on the page. That tells me interaction with the database. That tells me there might be something going on. I see the URL is now 42 slash name. When I click on the other one, I see the same. So the value changes for the profile. So there's definitely pulling data from the database. This is just a nice looking, friendly printed, whatever it's called, REST style URL that is using these this parameters here as values. And, uh, but that's the point, they are values. So if they are values, I can modify them to see what happens and test for SQL injection. So I'm just going to add the payload. And I get a MySQL error. This is enough to prove that MySQL injection is present on the site. Now the next step is to exploit it. And to do that, I'm going to figure out which one of the three characters is causing the SQL injection. Most people are going to assume that it's a single quote, but you never know. So in this case, I'm going to delete this tool, try it out, and it turns out that it's a backslash. It's probably escaping something and breaking the query. So that, that parameter is vulnerable. 
I'm going to tag with the other one. I also get an error message. So now I'm getting two error messages with this uh, as soon as I add the backslash and it's breaking the query. So next step I'm going to do is look a bit at the uh, HTML. I could use verb repeater, I could use your favorite tool, I could write a little script, I'm just going to use curl just to see the HTML, I could just inspect the HTML on the page. But it's, good. it's a good uh, moment to look at the contents of the page. And curl gives me the same error that I was looking at, and it also gives me something interesting in the HTML comments. The actual SQL query, my SQL query that was that has been that was run on the back end. This is obviously not a, a very realistic scenario, but the truth is that we have come across multiple instances where we found interesting bits of information in HTML comments. So it's something that uh, should never be overlooked. So it's time to analyze the query a little bit further. We see our backslash here escaped the single quote and made all of this become the value of the ID uh, parameter, leaving the rest to be the rest of the query. And this last single quote here break the query and cause the MySQL error. So the next thing I'm going to do is to fix this query. And for that, I want to do that because if I know how to fix it, I can then uh, make use of all the functions. And to do that, I'm going to replace the last parameter here with an always true query. So it's just an or one, so that I don't get any errors. But it doesn't work. <coughs> I see it's giving me back all of these without spaces. So that makes me think there's something going on, some kind of filtering. Maybe the, space, the spaces look like they are being filtered. So I'm going to replace the spaces with something else. By the way, SQL Map has a great plugin, Tamper Script, to bypass this kind of thing. So it's always good to know about which SQL Map Tamper Scripts to use. So I'm replacing the spaces with tabs. URL encoding for tabs is 09. And now it works. So now I've fixed the query. So let's take a look at what just happened. On the top, we have the query that was run on the back end. We see in yellow what has become now the value for the ID parameter. And at the bottom, we see the query we just ran where we fixed the execution in the back end. We are also underlining in red our important bits of information we have gathered, such as the table name, users, and two column names, ID and username. So based on this information, and the fact that we have a login form, my target now is to guess the password, to find the password. Because I have a users table with ID and username, I can assume that there's possibly a password column on the same table. So I want to get the number of columns on that table, I want to get the names of the columns, I want to get the data of the password column if there's one. Now to do that, I'm going to use some queries that are going to abuse some of the MySQL functionality to extract data, since I have these MySQL errors that I'm getting on the Western side. I'm just going to abuse some existing functionality to extract data. And this is all available on multiple SQL injection cheat sheets available on the internet. I just went to one of them and used a few functions. But usually it's just a matter of trying different ones until you get the ones that can extract the data successfully. So, at this point I'm copying and pasting because I can risk it so much. So I'm just going to run this one, run this one. It's a union query that helps me figure out the number of columns. Um, and it tells me the error that um, I put the wrong number of columns. So I'm going to add one here. I had three. And run, I'm going to add a fourth one. That means, that's basically saying, does this table have four columns? And I get no error. That means the table indeed has four columns. Next step, extract the name of the columns. And for this step, I'm going back to the command line. 
This was using a uh, technique that just joins one query with the same, one table with the same table, and it's, uh, it's basically saying if uh, I need the same number of columns on each side, you only provided two on one side, so I'm going to complain about the missing columns. Twitter was one of, the, one of the two missing columns. I have ID, I have username, and I have Twitter now, but I need a fourth one because I know there are four columns. So I add Twitter to the query, and I get the fourth one, which is called password, of course. And now, uh, the next step is then to retrieve the data that is in the password column. And for that, I'm going to use another, func another MySQL function that is going to help me just achieve that purpose. In this case, this is the polygon fa MySQL function. All, all it does is to calculate some areas for some polygon depending on the input. But the good thing about it is that it will complain about the specific values that stopped it from performing that calculation. So if I feed it the value of the password field, it will complain and spit it out as one of the values that is annoying the function. This is also a good example of how to avoid writing spaces on, a, on SQL injection by using parentheses. So I'm just going to launch this. And that's a password. That's the value that the polygon function is complaining about. Effectively, it's just allowing me to extract data from the database by abusing the error messages that it produces. Thank you. Thank you. So now that I have the password, it's time to test it. Look at that, a password field that is not masked. <laughs> Let's try it. And it works. Great. So this is just a bit of two lines of code that were in the back end, avoiding the, uh, escaping the single quote, that's why the single quote wasn't happening, wasn't working, and removing the spaces. So, Burp, uh, actually, Burp didn't find it in, the, in our initial assessment, but that was because we set Burp with the default settings. Once we turned Burp to use a thorough mode, and we checked the restyle URL parameter option, it actually found a SQL injection. That's why setting up the tools correctly is very important. On the other hand, SQL map was getting a bit confused, even though we pointed it we set it, at, as part of the input, we pointed it to the exact place where the SQL injection was happening, and it was not finding it. But you know what? The great thing about SQL Map is that it, it's a great tool, it's open source, so this whole thing just means a little side interesting project to figure out why SQL Map wasn't finding it. So last but not least, let's do some command injection. Barb, uh, sorry, Burp, found it with the default settings, so let's just go ahead and get a shell. What's the only place left on the site that we haven't looked into yet or found anything yet? The interesting link on the front page. We have a file name that yells file system interaction. So let's see what we can do with it. <clears throat> Obviously, well, the first thing we want to do is instead of reading the as.txt file, is to read an interesting file system. Uh, system file. That doesn't work. Well, maybe it doesn't accept uh, full paths. So why not? Why don't we try going up to the root file system and then going down? And it doesn't work. No results. So reading, <coughs> excuse me, reading files may not be working. Let's try something else. Let's try appending commands to it. There are, I know this is a Linux system already. I mean, I have, uh, by, uh, at this point, I should, have, I should have a pretty good idea of the backend layout. So let's try to append commands to it. Three ways I know of. If anybody knows any other ways, please let me know. Single, uh, sorry, semicolon to run a different command. It doesn't work. Pipe. Pipe. Next, next option. It doesn't work either. 
from the response, let's actually do something useful, such as running a bind shell on it that will allow us to connect to it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do and and, run netcat. Hopefully, they'll have netcat installed. Why wouldn't they? And <laughs> as soon as it gets some, uh, some, uh, a connection, it will run a shell on it, and it will listen on port 3333, and it'll be running in the background. So let's just run that, leave it running, go back to our shell, and connect to that remote uh, bind shell. We are connected. We, we have access to the system. Now, is this a shell? Yes, it is a shell. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, so in conclusion, uh, one of the coolest things that we actually get to do at our job is when anybody comes in for an interview, you get interviewed from the lowest guy and including what we refer to as the happy fairy. She works the front desk, she's a little crazy. Um, to the highest person there, which is our co our founder, Chris Roberts. If any of you have ever seen him speak, you won't forget it. Um, crazy Scottish guy, like super crazy. Um, but one of the cool things is, is uh, we ask a lot of questions. And for me and Antonio, a lot of the stuff we ask is, do you know how to do something besides run a tool? That's kind of what actually really we wanted to have towards the end of this was that you would feel comfortable enough to walk into an interview and if they said, hey, how would you find cross-site scripting and not have to look at somebody and go, well, I'd run Nessus with this plugin. Okay, we're not going to hire you. Okay, I would sit down and use this. Okay, we're going to seriously look at you. Again, we hope you feel like a super monkey at the end of this. You can go home and do whatever you want to your monkey. This poor bastard looks like he's getting thrown off a cliff. Uh, again, we'd love it if you guys followed us, especially we love having out-of-town friends. Um, Twitter handle's right there. Uh, if you have a second, go ahead and send us a request. If not, we're, we're okay with that too. Uh, does anybody have any questions? All right, we'll all sit here awkwardly and just eyeball each other. All right, well, we have no questions. Thank you, guys. Great job, guys. And Tony and Justin, everybody, come on, give it up a little bit more. These guys came all the way from Denver, Colorado. Imagine what they were smoking on the way. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that concludes uh, April SecKC. A um, reminder, May SecKC will be at Kanza Hall, which is in uh, 430, or I'm sorry, 119th and Metcalf. So uh, be watching the, what's that? Wednesday. 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 Wednesday.